Hello, welcome to Worship at Medicine Street United Methodist Church. I am Harriet Bryan and we are thrilled that you have joined us for worship. I want to extend a special word of thanks to my friend, the Reverend Dr. David Comperi for being our guest preacher this morning. His preaching has allowed me to finish creating our Lenten kit and I want to ask you to go online and register for our Lenten kit and our guide for the Lenten kit if you have not done so and you would like to have one. While you're there, I invite you to fill out the digital attendance card because we want to stay connected to you. And to that end, I would ask you if you have been receiving our Friday emails and you've not received it lately to check your spam folder. It is now coming from Paige at Medicine Street instead of Sherry at Medicine Street. And now friends, I invite you to light a candle if you have one nearby and to take a deep breath as we worship God together. We are met in the presence of God, and we do not meet alone. With the angels in the highest heaven, we gather to worship the Lord. With Abraham and Sarah, we gather to worship the Lord. With the saints of every age, we gather to worship the Lord. on our own journey of faith. God, God makes, makes us a great, great people. people.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Generous God, you gave us our voices, no two the same. As you did with Abraham and Sarah, you take and touch our lives and they become extraordinary. And in your church, you have gathered us in your community of common folk and complainers, prophets and puzzled people. You have called us and made a place for us. So let what we say and do in this time, what we ponder and decide, be real for us and honest to you as you prepare us for the life of the world in which you are praised. Amen. Friends, when we seek God's mercy, we draw close the mystery of faith, love that cannot be undone by our sin. Trusting that God is grace, let us offer to God the truth of our lives. Let us pray. Holy Lord, God of life, hear our prayer. Forgive us when we follow those paths that do not lead to life, that lead instead to violence or hate or fear paths that lead to dread and death. Forgive us when we forget that you offer us life, life that is abundant and eternal, life that began at the creation of all things. Forgive us, turn us to the right path, and let your love and grace flow over us and the world. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Friends, God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn it, but that the world might be saved through him. Through the saving love of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and blessed. Thanks be to God. Amen. Father Abraham had many sons, had many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Father Abraham has many sons, black ones and white ones, yellow, brown, and red ones. We all claim Father Abraham. Mother Sarah has many daughters. 
Poor ones and rich ones, young ones and older ones, we all claim Mother Sarah. I have a story, you have a story, God has a story. Look for yourself in the beginning of the story of Father Abraham. And Mother Sarah. And all people of faith. Good morning. I'm grateful to my friend and colleague, Harriet Bryan, for the opportunity of coming and sharing with you this morning. And even though it's not what we had hoped for when we first talked about this and has to be a virtual experience, I'm still delighted to share with you and grateful for the opportunity. I guess Harriet invited me back because she wanted to see if I, my preaching maybe had improved any. Uh, we'll see about that. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? Oh Lord, take the words that I utter, the words that we read from Scripture, and the echoes of our hearts and minds, and fashion them into your word for us, a word that can transform, inspire, lead us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. I think I've used the word unprecedented more in the last 10 months than I did in the preceding 10 years. I don't have to describe for you how unique this past 10 months has been for, for us. Not in a hundred years have we dealt with the pandemic that we're dealing with now. And to spiel out about the political situation we're in, the emotional and economic disruption that people are facing uh, would be unnecessary. You know, some of you know all too well what we've been through in these last months. Amanda Gorman in her inaugural poem a couple of weeks ago said, where can we find light in this never ending shade? That's a good question. Where is the light to be found? A number of years ago, a, a New Englander hired a guide to go into the wilderness of Vermont with him and to spend a few days there soaking up the experience of being in that beautiful portion of our country. After they'd been there a few days, the guide came up to the man and said, I hate to admit this, but I think we're lost. The man replied, I thought you said you knew New Hampshire like the back of your hand. Well, I do, but I think we're in Vermont now. Like Dorothy said, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. We have gone off the map. We're no longer in familiar territory. We're in uncharted waters. It's a different world than what we had before. As we look around for direction, hope, for inspiration and encouragement, for resources to navigate these strange waters, I think it might be helpful for us to look at the story, the beginning of the story of Abram the man that God called. Let us pay attention to Genesis 12, the first five verses of that chapter. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife, Sarai, and his brother's son, Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they went forth to go to the land of Canaan. This, my friends, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Abram was 75 years old. Sarah was 65 years old. They were wealthy, they were settled. Years before, Abram had traveled with his father from Ur of the Chaldees, a trip of 900 miles to go and settle in his new town. 
And now God was asking him, God was instructing him to leave that settled, happy spot and go off the map. Go to a land that he did not know. Go to a place he had never been before. Abram was obedient. He and Sarah left. They did as they were told. How could they do that? How could they, how could they pick up everything they had and strike out for something that they had no knowledge of, no sense of what it was to be like. My brother Billy was nine years older than I. He and I loved Bershop Springs Campground. Some of you have probably been there, a beautiful spot up on the Cumberland Plateau. The Methodist Assembly there was, was very much our home several summers. Shortly before my 14th birthday, my brother took me and his fiance and her brother on a day's excursion up there. We went to Laurel Falls, a place I'd been to many times, but I'd never been down Laurel Creek into the Savage Gulf area below. That's where Billy took us. It was not an easy journey. We went over boulders, there were large rocks, we had to jump across the stream several times. As we went along, I noticed that Billy kept looking to our right at the sheer cliff that was up there. We stopped for a breather, and Billy looked up and said, here's where we go up to the top. And I thought, I'm no eagle, I can't fly up there. How are we going to get up there? It's, it's just a sheer cliff. But my brother knew the territory better than I did, and he he found his way up to a thing they called stone door, a cleft in the rock that enabled you with some effort to get to the top. And there, when we emerged from that, that cleft, we, we had a beautiful view of the valley spread out below us. Now, 60 years later, I remember with a smile and joy that day. Billy took me places I didn't know, but it was a wonderful journey. And I followed him. I followed him because I didn't know what else to do, but more importantly, I followed him because I knew he cared for me. He had always been my protector, and he wouldn't allow harm to come to me. <laughs> I knew that he knew the territory better than I did, and I knew he wouldn't want to go back to my parents and say, I lost your older son. No, I followed him because I trusted him, and I knew him. I, I think Abram left his settled land for similar reasons. I believe that Abram trusted God. He knew that he had a promise from God. What was that promise? That promise was, I will show you the land I am promising you. I will take you there. I will be your companion. I will help you find your way. And even, even though Abram didn't know where he was going, he believed God's assurance. The writer of Hebrews talked about Abram's faith in God. He put it this way. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abram trusted God, and he went on a journey. And because he went on a journey, multitudes have been blessed. Last week you heard two scriptures, one about Jonah who tried to run away from God's call. It didn't work out too well for him. And the other story was about Jesus calling Peter and Andrew and James and John and how they left their nets immediately and followed him even though he never told them where they were going, even though they were heading out of their familiar, easy life. They followed him. Somehow they trusted Jesus and were willing to go off the map with him, risking their security and their comfort to follow him, 
to be with him. The question for us in these days is, are we willing to follow Jesus closely during this unprecedented time as we wander off the map of what is familiar and comfortable and easy? Are we sure that we're willing to trust him even though we face challenges, even though we encounter hardships? Being in the wilderness challenges faith. It leads people to be tempted to fear and, and distrust the children of Israel after being liberated from Egypt, wandered in the wilderness, and, and they began to grumble against God. They, they began to mistrust God. They, they decided to fashion for themselves a golden calf, another kind of God who wouldn't challenge them, who wouldn't lead them into other darknesses, who wouldn't ask of them more than they wanted to do. The temptations come in the wilderness very easily and very frequently. The temptation to make a God who doesn't challenge us. Jesus himself faced temptation in the wilderness. He was tempted to forget his mission. He was tempted to use his powers for his own selfish needs. He was tempted to turn his back on the God who had sent him. But Jesus, Jesus resisted those temptations. He used scripture against the devil. He, he clung to his knowledge that he had a purpose and he trusted his heavenly father who sent him to be a part of God's mission, God's work. The closing verses of John 6 tell us that when Jesus began to preach some difficult words, some of those who had been following him turned away and began to leave him. They peeled off. They went back to the comfortable way they had been living. Jesus turned to his closest friends and he said, Are you going to leave me too? And Simon Peter, bless his heart, for all of his faults and all of his confusions and all of his weaknesses, looked at Jesus and said, To whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have seen and we believe that you are the Holy One of God. We will follow you wherever you go. Do we have the same belief? Are we willing to claim this kind of faith and trust in following Jesus during these difficult and challenging days? God gave Abram a second promise, and that promise was that he, by following, would become a blessing for multitudes and generations yet to come. You will be blessed by me, God said, and I will make you a blessing for those who come after you. A blessing that comes because you will march off of the map and go into the unknown that I call you. And so Abram and Sarah trusted God with everything they had. They left. God's promised presence did not shorten the trip. It didn't eliminate all the difficulties, but they persevered, and God was faithful to his promise. They discovered that they could look forward to that city whose architect and builder is God. The disciples saw Jesus' power, and they followed him. They trusted him because they had seen his mighty works. And eventually, that trust paid off because they discovered that he had conquered the tomb and death. Here's the real challenge in these days where there's no road map to follow, no triple A to give us directions, no McDonald's along the journey. Of following Jesus, the journey that we're asked to make, if we're going to do that, if we're going to let him be his guide, then we're going to have to share in his work. We're going to have to be part of his ministry. We're going to have to emulate his example of service and sacrifice. What I'm talking about is actually a challenge of stewardship. 
stewardship, committing our time, our talents, our resources to the work that God calls us to, to following Jesus and being a part of his ministry, bearing fruit for God's kingdom, helping transform the darkness into light. Matthew reports that Jesus' last words were a promise. I will be with you even to the end of the age. I will be your companion in all that you go through. What a wonderful promise. But that promise, that, that great promise, that great assurance was preceded by the great commandment. Go into the world. Make disciples. Teach. Baptize. Serve. Be my representatives in the tough world that's out there. Be a part of the work of the kingdom. He said that that meant taking up your cross daily and carrying it. It means sacrificing. It means making God's work more important than anything else. Letting go so that others may have. Walking alongside others to help them come to trust that Jesus has the words of life. I believe in stewardship. I believe in tithing. I think it's important for me to commit at least 10% of what I have to God's work so that I'll know how to live with the other 90%, so that I will be able to find joy and meaning in my faith. I think it's important for me not to just give, but to share my time, my energy, my caring, to reach beyond my own concerns so that I can be blessed by being a blessing to others, by serving the church that I love. It's about my baptismal covenant to, to submit to the claim of Christ, the claim that really all that I am and all that I have belongs to him, yielding to God's will, even as I enjoy God's gifts. It's about not getting caught up in the material obsessions of our society and giving myself in love and in caring to my Lord and to the people around me. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, be careful about storing up treasures here on earth because they don't last. Moths eat, thieves steal, rust corrupts. Store up treasures in heaven, he said. I believe when he said that, he wasn't talking about just hoping for something in eternity. I think he was telling us to practice living in heavenly ways here on earth by using what we have and what we are as part of God's heavenly work. The call to live as a servant, to be a steward of 100% of what God has given me, Helps me not to follow other gods. Instead, to keep my eyes fixed upon Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of my faith, as the writer of Hebrews put it. The goal of my faith. So that following Jesus as my Lord and my guide, I can be blessed by being a means of blessing, by being a servant in the work of the Lord. Following Jesus has this rhythm of receiving and giving, of accepting God's forgiveness and offering forgiveness to those who have hurt me, of receiving the bounty of God's creation for my, me and my family and sharing that bounty so that others may know it as well. That's what we do when we are grounded in God's call to us, even when we have to go off the map. When the World Trade Center on 9-11 was hit by a plane, there was a policeman who ran into the first building and ran up trying to be of help to people. One of those wonderful first responders we owe so much to. After the towers had collapsed, a chaplain came and, and interviewed this policeman. And he described how he was up many stories when he became disoriented because of the smoke, the haze, 
he began to cough. He, he began to fear for his life. And, and after wandering around and sort of losing direction, he, he basically sat down expecting to die. And then he heard someone yelling for help and, and his, his commitment to service kicked in and he fought his way through the darkness and the smoke and, and found the person who was calling out for help and he somehow got that person and they found their way down the steps out those, those floors, down all the way down, and, and were able to, to emerge just minutes before the tower collapsed. The policeman turned to the chaplain and said, I was saved because I heard someone cry for help. Right now there are lots of folks crying for help around us. Right now there are people needing to hear good news. And we are called, if we're following Jesus, to hear those cries for help, even when we are lost ourselves, even when we are confused, even when we are perplexed and frightened. We can do that because, you see, we have a guide who knows the territory, who owns the territory. So if you feel like you're wandering around uncertain, struggling to find hope, maybe you're one of those who has been so adversely affected by this pandemic, one of those who is so frightened for the future of our nation, one of those who just doesn't know what to do or how to traverse this rugged terrain that we're in. I invite you, I invite you to recommit in these moments to following Jesus and trusting in him, hearing his voice, knowing that it's more important for you to hear the cries of need around you than to wallow in your own concern, knowing that it is by following him into the paths of service, of love, of stewardship of all that you have, of being willing to serve, following his examples, learning from his words, knowing that he has the words of life, that is where your hope is. That is where your future can be. That is where you can discover a wonderful view. So I invite you to look to Jesus, to read his words and to follow his example, to know that he has the words of life so that you can place yourself and all that you have at his disposal, letting him be your guide, your hope, your example. I invite you this week to follow him by looking for ways in which you can join his mission to bring good news to someone, someone who's lost hope, someone who's sick, someone who's discouraged, someone who's hungry, spiritually or physically, someone who needs the good news that you can be, that you can deliver. Amanda Gorman ended that poem on Inauguration Day with these words. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. There is always light if only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. I invite you to be the light for someone else. Not out of your own light, but the light that you're reflected because you follow Jesus. We can be like Jonah and try to run away from the call to follow. It won't do us any more good than it did Jonah. Or we can be like Abram and Sarah, like Andrew and Peter and James and John. We can decide to commit all that we have and all that we are to being faithful to the call of discipleship. Yeah, we're off the map right now, but Jesus Christ is our guide. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He knows Vermont, he knows New Hampshire, and he knows every place else better than anyone. And he's the one who can lead us to the city, the foundation whose builder and architect is God. You see, we're never off the map of God's grace. We're never, 
ever beyond Christ's redemption. That is the good news for us today. Let us pray. O oh Lord, shine your light upon the darkness around us and upon our own hearts so that we can reflect that light, to see our own way and to help others find their way into your loving arms that we may live in hope, in faith, in joy, regardless of where we are. In the name of Christ. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we bring to you in prayer the hopes and needs of this world. Often we see the needs to be overwhelming and our resources too few to even make a difference. Give us faith to believe that when given in your name, even the smallest gift can change the world. In a world filled with hate and division, help us offer peace. In a world filled with inequality, help us to speak justice. In a world filled with loneliness and isolation, help us to offer friendship and the gift of our presence. Loving God, we ask your healing for all those who are hurting in mind, body, or spirit. We pray for all who are suffering from the effects of COVID, and we pray an end to this pandemic. We pray for doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, scientists, and researchers, and all who work to end suffering. Bless all those who offer healing in your name. For all people this day who are mourning the loss of a loved one, God, we ask that you bring your comfort to them. On days when grief feels too heavy to bear, lift them up and help them find the assurance of your abiding presence. God of all ages, we pray for your church universal. May your work be our work. May your vision be our vision. And may your gospel be our gospel. Bless us now as we pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, I join with Dr. Comperi in reminding us that all that we have and all that we are is a gift from God. And what we give back is our gift to God. Give now as you are able and led. Thank you. 
Friends, if you are worshiping with us for the first time today online, we extend a special welcome to you. We are glad that you have joined us and we hope that you found the worship service meaningful. We encourage you to fill out the digital attendance card so that we can help answer any questions that you may have and help you connect more deeply to the ministries here at Madison Street. If you're feeling that you may be called to live out your journey of discipleship here by becoming a member of this congregation, we invite you to participate in our next Discover Madison Street class, which will be held on February the 21st. This will be a hybrid class, meaning that you can join either online via Zoom or here in person. You can register for that by visiting our website and clicking on events and registrations. And now, friends, as we prepare to go out into the world, may we do so singing our faith together. Go forth from this place today, my friends, knowing that the Jesus we've talked about today, the Jesus I've invited you to follow, is the one who will go with you and be his companion, not just to walk with him, but to serve alongside of him, that you may discover that the love he proclaimed lives in your hearts and surrounds you forever.
next. Ooh. <laughs> Mommy. <laughs> God, God makes, makes us. us <laughs> Regina. <laughs> no. God, God makes us. <laughs>